Now, <coughs> the reason why I ask these questions is because we have built an understanding over time. What is and what is not spiritual? What is and what is not discipleship? And what I want to do is I want to put everybody in the same level plane of understanding of what it means to make disciples. Okay? So, we're going to have to get to this in a number of steps, and we're going to have to go back to Ephesians after the marriage passage to discuss these things. And what we're going to do is formulate the foundation of raising children by understanding marriage and our responsibility for discipleship. Okay? So, think about that. Write your, your comments and responses to this question in terms of, is there a difference between raising children and discipleship? Okay? And then we'll talk about this ongoing. But now we have the same footing in terms of authority and what it means to disciple. Okay. All right. What role does baptism play in discipleship and how are we to understand the use of the names Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? So what is baptism in terms of discipleship and where does the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit come in? Because remember, Sam, uh, Brother Samuel said that when we disciple, we're supposed to baptize and teaching them uh, to obey everything that he has commanded us. So where does baptism fall into this process of discipleship? Birth. What was that? Birth. birth? Okay. So spiritual birth has happened when somebody is baptized. Okay. I mean, it happens before they get baptized, but baptized, uh, baptism is a symbol of we've been, <coughs> we've been spiritually uh, reborn. Okay. okay. <coughs> is there anything else in reference to discipleship uh, as it relates to baptism. Make an open, open um, declaration? Yeah. So an open announcement that I'm a Christian. I just became one. Okay, that's back. How is that related to uh, discipleship? It's the first act of obedience. Very first of act of obedience is discipleship. This is why you can't delay the uh, baptism. Because if you delay three months, you know, four months, or whatever, after you become a Christian, your first act becomes like, I don't know, secondary. So if you see in the New Testament, when baptism occurred, when did it occur each time? Right after they believed. I mean immediately. So obedience, if we're going to emphasize obedience, then we have to emphasize immediate obedience, not postponed obedience. And right after I became a Christian, just from the Catholic background, because I was already sprinkled baptized when I was an infant, and then sprinkled baptized when I was what do they call that? Uh, Catholics uh, okay. um, confirmed. Okay, I was confirmed 12, 13 years. Uh, they sprinkled me again. And then when I was 20, I actually became a Christian. For real. Okay. And I said, give me baptism. Baptize me. What I, what I experienced before, I didn't believe all I was was showered. More like a shower, it was not a baptism. He sprinkled me. So, get me baptized. So, I asked my friend, you know, we need baptized. Oh, yeah, we have a baptismal that we can rent. So, we arranged it and we got baptized. I got baptized. So, that was my actual baptism. All right? Because I wanted to be obedient and I wanted to do it right away. All right? So, baptism is the first act of obedience, yes, and how is that related to discipleship? What does the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have to do? Okay. Right. 
the children to be obedient? Yes. If you don't, remember it says, Jesus said this, if you don't teach your kids or your disciples, see you know where we're going now? You will see that. If you don't teach your disciples to obey, you haven't done anything. You certainly have not discipled. Do you see that? So if we have a church full of, of knowledgeable people, there's great teaching going on every single week. But when they go home, they beat their wives, they beat their children, they, they spend their money however they want, they're not kind. What is that? That's not discipleship. No. No, that's not discipleship. Discipleship has not occurred. Remember, it's a transfer of a life. All right. Now. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What has that got to do with baptism? And what has that got to do with discipleship? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I baptize you. So, you want to believe in Jesus? Yes, I want to follow him for the rest of my life. Man, he's the best thing that ever happened to me. Okay, let's get baptized. Baptize you in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Boom. Okay? Why the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? They have the authority. Authority is definitely uh, <coughs> present. Okay? Without the authority, you know, what does it matter? What NIV, else? In the NIV, the in, there's also another version that says into, that means baptize you into, that means you now belong. Right. To, um, it kind of like transfer you from the kingdom of darkness to to the kingdom of the Father, the mm -hmm. Son, and the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Uh, Paul says that we were uh, we were given one one uh, spirit to drink. We were certainly baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit. But what else? How is it related to discipleship? Keep going. See, ingrained I think that's very important that tell you what to obey, what to listen to, what to follow, what to you want to transfer from what to what. Right. We now belong to this group. <laughs> group. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We belong to this family. We belong to this authority structure. We belong to this kingdom. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as I was thinking about this, what's going to happen when you get baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you're a brand new Christian? Okay. Veterans don't ask these kinds of questions, and perhaps it's because we are all veterans that we forget. Okay, so we got I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's second nature to us, but for a brand new Christian, what's the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Right? What's the first question you're going to ask when you get baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? What do they do? <laughs> what do they do? <laughs> we ask one question. Anything else? Yeah, who are they? If you were a Jew, you would say... I know, but if you were... Huh? Yeah? Uh, well, okay, if you were a Jew, remember, they say, the Lord our God is one. one. So if you were a Jew, what are you going to do? What are you going to ask? Who's the son? Huh? Who's the son? Yeah, who's the son? Who's the, who's the spirit? Do we have one God or three gods? Right? Because the Jews say, there's only one God. So do we have three gods? No. So what's going to happen immediately? What do, you, what do you have to do when they start asking them questions, asking you questions? Theology. Hmm? You have to give them theology, you have to teach them, right? So just by mentioning the three, there's going to be questions if you didn't get to that part, right? Okay? 
in the gospel you're saying yes you need to follow the son you need to give your life to the son and then he will give you a relationship with him that's how you get your sins forgiven and and God the father sacrificed his son he said okay understand all that after you put your faith in him you got to get baptized that's part of the gospel message right and so they start doing that and then you get baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy who's holy what's the Holy Spirit right did you mention the Holy Spirit in your gospel no did they mention the Holy Spirit uh, well we don't know what the Ethiopian uh, eunuch did but uh, did Paul uh, or Peter mention the Holy Spirit with Cornelius he certainly mentioned it to the Jews you know out there times are refreshing and you know, all of that stuff he mentioned that but not everybody and not in all messages of the gospel do we mention even the Holy Spirit so some of them didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit they got saved right and the apostles showed up and said we didn't know about the Holy Spirit what are you talking about we just heard the gospel and we embraced the gospel and didn't even hear about the Holy Spirit so if you say Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, there's going to be questions. Okay? But there's also other aspects to it, too. Remember, three witnesses. Two or three witnesses, and it's done. Right? So we got three witnesses in the baptism, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means it's done. Okay. Number five. What is inferred in the Lord's command to teach everything that he has commanded us? Why does he say, command everything, uh, or teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you? What did four gospel writers remember? Okay. <clears throat> so, we're supposed to disciple in reference to the only the four gospels in terms of Jesus. And also what Holy Spirit... I think it's somewhere it says Holy Spirit will also <coughs> remind you of what I told yeah, John. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. So what the Holy Spirit reminds us of what he taught. Anything else? That's a little tough. <laughs> yeah, I mean whatever he commands, I mean he referenced the Old Testament all the time too. <coughs> so in terms of being obedient to Jesus, when he said teach them everything that I have commanded you, what can't we do? Receive the command. <coughs> we can't receive it. <coughs> okay. Receive what command? The Lord's command. Oh, you mean uh, we need to receive his command. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So we need to receive the command. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. He says, teach them everything that I have commanded you. What did Jesus command the, the apostles or the disciples? A lot, a lot of things, right? So they're going to take all that the Lord taught them, and then they're going to teach their disciples. What does that sound like? Discipleship. What does that sound like? Parenting. What does that sound like? Life. Okay? But he says, everything that I commanded you, which means, what am I not responsible for? Anything that he didn't command me, right? Okay? So, anything that he didn't command me, I'm not responsible for it. If he did command me, then I'm responsible for it. Why am I emphasizing that? Because when volunteers, whatever it is, okay, and when we're asking for people to disciple, they go, oh, oh, I can't teach everything, and I don't know a whole lot, and you know, what am I going to do? And blah, 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 blah. okay, <laughs> is that what you do with your kid? Oh, I don't know what to do, and I got to know all of these things, and I got to. Uh, I gotta teach them how to cook, you know, I gotta teach them how to 
balance a checkbook, I gotta teach him how to get a job. <clears throat> okay? What Jesus said is very, very convicting, but it's also encouraging at the same time. Because Jesus is not going to hold you responsible for what you don't know. He's going to hold you responsible for what you do know. He's going to hold you responsible for what He has commanded you, what has He has taught you in your life. See? So whatever Jesus taught you, what do you do? You confidently teach that. everything that I have commanded you. So, if you don't know it, then you don't have to worry about being responsible for it. But you are responsible for constantly learning. Right? So the, like I said, uh, 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 right? It goes through you. Because you're transferring a life. Alright? So, you learn from Him. Because you learn from Him, you teach your disciples. See, remember what they said. And all of these things came when I was a, a brand new believer. You can't give away what you don't have. And guess what? Jesus doesn't expect you to give away what you don't have. Don't try to pretend to give away what you don't have. Right? But you're responsible for you don't know. Yes. So but you're not responsible have... to teach what you don't know. You're responsible to only teach what you do know. Right? You're, you're supposed to be learning all the time, but what God has trained you, that's what God has given you, what God is doing in your life, guess what? You better teach that. Because that is your life. You're transferring your life to your disciples. Okay? Ignore that, though. It's annoying sometimes. Especially when we're just getting into it. Right? All right. The, uh, it says, the, in light of passages like, he, has never, uh, he will never leave us nor forsake us, is the fact that he will be with us always redundant. Remember? He will never leave us, he will never forsake us. Other texts have said that. Hebrew says it. The Old Testament says it. So, why is Jesus saying, I will be with you to the end of the age or to the ends of the uh, earth? Why, why does he need to say that? Because uh, without me, he has Right. John said, when he said that in the book of John, he said, without me, you can do nothing. That's absolutely true. Okay. That's the reality. But does he need to reassure us that he will be with us wherever we, we go? If we already know that. We need to be constantly reminded. Okay, we, we, we need to be constantly reminded, we need to constantly be encouraged. But when does he do the encouraging? When we go. When we go. Okay. When do we need the greatest amount of encouragement that he is with us? Facing challenges. Yeah. And what's the greatest challenges? When he left, and what we have to do? What do we have to do? Make disciples. Make disciples. In the context of making disciples, he says this. Which means, when is it important? We can, we can do nothing. But when is it important that he need, uh, we need to know that he is with us? When we're making disciples. When do we need God the most? When we're raising our kids, <laughs> isn't that right? <laughs> oh, Lord, we need you. We need you so badly. Because apart from you, we can do nothing. We can't raise our kids. We can't make disciples without it. And when somebody says to us, when we go and tell them, total strangers, you need to obey Jesus, you know, who are you? Right? Well, I'm his spokesman. He told me to tell you to obey him. Really? Yep. That's why I'm telling you. Do we have the authority to be such a civil fellowship? Everywhere you go, you have been commissioned to repeat his words, repent, and believe the gospel. 
everywhere you go, you have the authority. God has given you the authority to speak on his behalf everywhere you go that they need to be obedient to Jesus. We don't have any excuses. We have been given the authority to declare it. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to uh, excuse for it. That's it. So when people say, okay, give you ammunition. When people say Christians are bigots, they say Jesus is the only way. Right? They say Jesus is the only way to God. He's the only way of salvation. What do you say? Yes. That's true. You say, I'm not a bigot. No. I'm not a bigot. You're not a bigot either. You're not prejudiced. You're not a bigot. You're not. What you are is faithful. Okay? Because you're not the bigot. He is. Jesus is the one who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You didn't say that. You're just a mouthpiece. He told me to tell you. You don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with Jesus. Go work it out. Don't let somebody tell you you're a bigot. If they call you a bigot, they're just wrong. I'm just faithful. You have a problem with Jesus. Jesus is the one who said that. I didn't say that. I didn't invent it. So, go call him a bigot. Right? Did you say that? Did you invent it? No. He's the one who said that. Okay? We're just being faithful to what he told us to tell you. There is no other way. Okay? People have problems. I just want to say one other thing. People have problems when they say there's only one way. Tons of ways to get to the mountain. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but heaven is not a mountain. There are tons of ways to do this and that. Yeah, but if that's the way you want it, then well, then give me your computer. Because I'm just going to type in any old password and I'm going to get in. Is that right? No, you can only type in one password to get in. And you're the one who set the password. So should anybody be able to type in any password and get in? So now are you a bigot? Right? You're a bigot because there's only one password that works. That doesn't make any sense. Okay? He's the one who said it. He's the one who determined it. That's the way it is. I'm just being faithful. Right? So here we have discipleship. We have authority. And we have assurance that he will be with us when we are being obedient in the process of discipleship. Okay. Then theologically, in uh, question 7, we get to compare the commandment, uh, com or compare this commandment to God's command in Genesis 128. Remember what Genesis 128 is? Be fruitful and multiply, uh, mm -hmm. the earth. Okay. So, how is it different or alike? Is Jesus unknowing the command of Genesis 128 by making or commanding us to make disciples of all nations? I thought we were supposed to fill the earth and, and subdue it. Did God just, did Jesus just annul that so that now we're just focusing on discipleship? We're not supposed to take care of the planet anymore? We're not supposed to populate the earth? Did he just cancel that by saying that? No? What did he do then? I'm not here to right. So we, still have to do that. we still have to do that. Then does this oppose it, fight against it? No. He specifies it. Makes it even more clear? Yeah. How? He made it simple. He made it simple.
originally there was a, there was already a reconciliation, so we can focus on the primary thing that we were supposed to do. Now there isn't reconciliation, so then we're going to get reconciled. So that happens. Okay. Here is the process, and here is the order. <coughs> when we didn't have sin, what did we have? We have the command of God. We had the commission, and we're actually fulfilling it, right? Now, we became disobedient, we're running and going off in our own direction. So now what do we have to do? Yeah, we have to get called back. We have to get refocused. We have to regroup and get everybody together and say, this is what we're supposed to do. You're, you're doing your own thing. You're not supposed to be doing your own thing. You're supposed to be doing what God wants you to do. So, in order to get to that point where they would listen to us, what are we doing? We have to get them to the point where they say, God, we want to start listening to you, obeying you, right? So they have to become Christians first before we fulfill Genesis 1, 28. <clears throat> so God still has the same priority. He still has the same command. Now he had to take a little step backwards and say, okay, instead of just taking care of the planet by yourself because you can't do it by yourself, you have to get people to help you. And guess what? All of these people don't even care about my commands. So you have to get them to first base before you get them to second base and you go to third base. You know, and then we can complete the task, right? The priority has shifted not to things, but people. He shifted it because it needed to be shifted because they're all, the people are already assumed in the book of Genesis that they're being obedient to the Lord, right? Because we were, there was no sin. But because they're not being obedient to the Lord, we have to get to the point where they're being obedient to the Lord. See how obedience is essential. As a matter of fact, it's plastered all over Scripture. Remember I said if you divide the Bible, uh, it, it's first three chapters, right? First three chap chapters is the tragedy, the disobedience. The rest of the book is the solution. Well, guess what? The rest of the book is the solution via obedience. Therefore, the obedience is emphasized. If you don't teach your kids obedience, you tell them nothing. That's why we have to talk about training. If we taught our fellow believers, our sheep, as leaders, if we have not taught obedience, we've taught them nothing. Where is the burden? The burden is in the teacher. That's why if you don't do your homework, I can't slap you, but I want to try to motivate you as much as possible to get into it. And then one, of, one session, all we're going to do is sit here and actually do the work so that you can know how to do the work. Because if we don't do that, and we don't teach you how to study the Bible, <coughs> work through it, then we've taught you nothing. What is your responsibility? Your responsibility is to make every effort to be obedient to God's word and his teachers, as Hebrew says. Shall we pray together so that we can work on this? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for solidifying for us what is necessary to be transformed and have the life of Jesus in us that the process of discipleship is transferring one life to another. Whether we receive that from you or whether we give that away to our disciples and our children, that is discipleship as you have revealed it, as your son has demonstrated it. We pray, Father, that you would draw our hearts as we seek you and as we desire to obey you. And Father, that as we make the effort to transfer our lives to others, especially our children, that you assure